Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. We have back returning guest, on to guest Mr. Mr. Bill Holter, joining us for return engagement. As always, we appreciate having him here, a, a very financial expert, especially in the area of precious metals for many, many decades, and a purveyor of all facts. And so we're honored to have him once again. If you are new, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow accordingly. Bill Holter, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming back again. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, it's an honor, believe me. Okay, so uh, we pulled some uh, good questions. We haven't talked in a few months, so I wanted to try to queue up some new things. So firstly, Bill, in our previous podcast, you made, a, you made a point that struck a chord with me. You said instead of looking at what the dollar collapse would do to China, you said, what if China were the one to blink first, citing their equal number of financial problems? Looking at the current landscape of the financial climate, do you still think China will blink first? Or have they improved their position enough through the BRICS to be positioned ahead of the dollar going forward? Well, yeah, they've, they've definitely uh, improved their position by uh, by being not just part of, but one of the leaders of BRICS. Uh, and also, you have to understand, they, I mean, they've accumulated way, way, way more gold than they say. I mean, they've got... Mm -hmm. I don't. I can. I can almost guarantee you they've got more than twenty five thousand tons, and they say they have what twenty nine hundred tons or whatever. Um, so in the event of a a collapse of the West, a collapse of the dollar, um, and obviously that would collapse, and their their debt is collapsing on its own anyway, especially the real estate debt. Um, but once gold is revalued. That'll make up all and then some of the losses that are, you know, structured. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, and I agree with you that they're definitely manipulating the numbers and suppressing what they have, just like we're doing here in the U.S. with many things on employment and the like. Um, Staying on the China front, Bill, they continue to make, as you said, aggressive gold moves. They're also working, as you know, with Javier Malay of Argentina. Um, they're also providing debt forgiveness to several African nations. How much time do you imagine that we have to become our own central bank before they try to fully take over in 2030? Huh. 2030, I mean, that's a dream. I, I think much, if not all of this, is going to go down between now and the election. And as far as the election really? is concerned, I've had a little bit of time to, to think mm -hmm. after watching the uh, debate debacle and then watching uh, Biden's interview with Stephanopoulos, uh, my thought process is, I mean, they're, the, the left is in shambles now. Uh, you know, they're talking about bringing, putting Kamala Harris on the ticket, uh, maybe with a, Michelle Obama as vice president or Barack Obama as vice president. They're, you know, the uh, Newsom's name has been thrown forward. I think it's it's too late to recover from it. I mean, basically, basically, uh, the American people were completely gaslit for the last four years because Joe Biden, he didn't even campaign in 2020. He stayed in his basement. Mm -hmm. And the reason he did that was because if he was out in public, people would have seen him for what he is, you know, basically declining uh, mentally. And what this tells me is that the odds that I thought uh, were in favor of uh, 40, 60, or 35, 65, that we would not have an election, um, those have gotten even even worse. I, I At this point, I think there's only about a 25% chance we have an election. And we I, I do believe we will have some type of uh, false flag event prior to the election so that they can say, oh, well, we can't have an election or, you know, everything's got to be mail in ballot. I mean, who who knows what they're going to come up with? But I do believe they're going to come up with something. And as far as I can tell or, or you know, in, in my thought process, I think it's highly likely now that we do not have an election. And I mean, they, mm -hmm. they're not going to willingly uh, walk away from power. Right. I agree with you. I, I've had some time to think from our last interview as well. And I'm thinking that 
just, you know, all the events that you said that have matriculated coupled with what we know is really going on behind the scenes with manipulation and suppression, it, it is definitely likely that, that we're not going to have an election. So do you think it'll be a cyber attack or do you think it'll be something else altogether? Who knows? Who knows? It could be bird flu. Yeah. They, could nuke a, they could nuke a city. I mean, you know, these people have absolutely zero conscience whatsoever. So, um, you know, whatever is in your wildest imagination, it's probably worse than that. Yeah, sobering, isn't it? Um, so that actually brings up, I'm glad you brought up the election because I did uh, kind of prep some questions for that. So let's see what of that uh, while we're talking about it. So I missed the fake news manufactured chaos, as you said. Uh, there's talk of Russian-Ukraine peace deal. We already know that President Trump has that in mind as his overarching agenda here. As this is a script. Um, could this be the event that calms people down or maybe his proverbial Trump card to counteract what they're going to try to do? What, a, a peace deal with Russia? Uh, with Well, with Ukraine or even just anything that's going on overseas. Um, I don't really think that a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine is going to really calm anything down. Um, if if anything, a peace deal with Russia is going to bring out a lot of truth. And that truth is we've been gaslit, you know, since the beginning. Uh, the casualties are way, way higher than what we're being told. And I also think there's a, a big danger to the West, a big danger to the United States. Um, with a peace deal, what will come forth out of that is that there's, what is there, 16 or 18 bio labs that they've discovered in okay. Ukraine yeah. funded by the United States. Uh, but that's not in mainstream news. Uh, imagine mm -hmm. if, that if that broke and mainstream news actually followed it or some other way that the population gets informed that, you know, we were making biological weapons all along, uh, obviously going against, you know, past treaties signed that bio biological weapons, you know, are war crimes. So, Bill, we see, uh, speaking on the subject of the whole of America, the mainstream everyday person, we see businesses closing, malls drying up, as well as commercial and residential real estate tanking. Uh, the National Association of Realtors, their last report, I think, was April, was around 8% of home sales decline. I don't know what it is at this point. Maybe you have some, you can shed some light on that. But sadly, the whole of society doesn't seem to notice overall. You had told me on the last interview that you thought it would be a 72-hour event where people would come home on a Friday, wake up on a Monday, and everything's tanking. Do you still see that being the case? And if so, what is it going to take for people to, as a collective, to wake up and take action? Yeah, after, after uh, the world turns three times, 72 hours, I can envision markets not being able to open. Something's going to happen, uh, and, and if it's during the week, then each day it will become more difficult for markets to even open, and I think by the third day it won't open. Um, if they decide to pull this off over a weekend, then nothing will open Monday morning, and life as we knew it uh, will, will be pretty much gone forever, and you can already see that. The things you just talked about, um, the, the office vacancies, uh, hotel vacancies, except for the immigrants. I mean, look at New York City. The, the government's already given a billion dollars to hotels in New York City. That's the only reason they haven't uh, bankrupted. But a lot of these hotels and a lot of these commercial uh, office buildings, they're not, uh, they don't have the, the uh, they're not full enough to create enough cash flow to be able to refinance or to even be able to pay past debt service. I mean, I just read a story yesterday, I forget where it was, where a piece of a, a, a commercial uh, office building just got, had their debt uh, bought for roughly 10 or 11 percent of what the what the pricing was in 2020. So I mean, to say that that 
commercial real estate office buildings across the board are down 50% in value. That's not even an outlandish statement. Yeah, no, sadly, you're right. It's not. I mean, I did a little field research a couple of weeks ago with a friend uh, at the local mall here in California, and the Macy's furniture division is a shell of its old self. And what they're selling, they're selling for like 85, 90% off. So you can see, you can see it right in front of you. And, and I'm just still amazed that people collectively don't see that. Um, but I think, like you said, it'll just become more and more inevitable. Okay, so um, let me look at the next question here for you. So one of the other things is you're well aware we need to be watching is the 10-year treasury yield market on a continual basis. Fed seem to have a pretty voracious appetite at the moment for buying debt, but no, who knows how long they will or be able to sustain that. Um, do you see the bond market imploding 10% maybe this year, or do you think that kind of goes into next year after things are settled on the election front? Well, first off, uh, the Fed will buy whatever is necessary to buy. They will go down with the ship, no question about it. There's there's zero there's zero chance that the Fed walks away and lets the Treasury go hang. I mean, basically, they're the same department, they're the same agency. They've merged, so there's no way that the Fed is going to walk away. The Fed will be uh, the last and only buyer of any resort for treasuries when all is said and done. Um, as far as uh, watching the volatility in treasuries, I've argued that, uh, you know, cause everybody's at the beginning of the year, everybody's talking about what, three, four, five, six different rate cuts. Um, and my argument is, yeah, they, they very well may cut. They may be forced to cut by some type of market, uh, you know, short-term, short term or you know complete meltdown the fed's going to be forced to cut rates but they only sh they only control overnight rates and if foreigners are looking at whatever is or has happened and they're dumping treasuries left and right i mean if you got china japan and others uh liquidating treasuries you could you could conceivably see the fed cut interest rates yet market rates go higher and market rates are justified to go higher because, and I've said this probably for a year or two now, there's absolutely zero uh, risk premium in the yield on treasuries. Um, I mean, you can, you can argue all you want that inflation is 2.6% and a 10 year treasury at 4.2 or 4.3 is going to give you, you know, one and a half or one and three quarters percent real return, but that's complete bullshit because inflation's not 2.6 percent. Um, I would say inflation's closer to 26 percent than 2.6 percent. You're probably looking at a a true inflation rate sniffing at 20 percent now. So what I'm getting at is, anybody who's buying treasuries is is guaranteeing a loss of purchasing power. I mean bonds. Uh, the best description of, of bonds today are certificates of guaranteed confiscation of your purchasing power. Yeah, yeah, there's there's no, I mean, obviously, you know, BRICS is running away as quick as possible from all bond related activity. And it's hard to imagine why any American would want to take it on if they're not when then not to say nothing of the as you know, the big BRICS meeting in, in October, where I think there's going to be roughly 100 nations where it's well over 70% of the world's population is adamantly moving away from the hegemony, and we know why. Um, let me turn our attention real quick, Bill, to one of your many specialties, which is in the areas of obviously precious metals. So the past month or so, you've noticed, obviously, silver has been struggling to maintain the price above 30. And every time it does, they try to slam it down. Uh, I checked, I think this morning it was at 31.11 last I checked. Do you think that 30 is the, the floor and then it's going to go 50 to 75? And the reason I ask is because it seems like every time it gets over 30 for any length of time, they slam it down. Uh, well, first off, the only time we, we got over 30 since 2011 was the past few weeks. So it's not every time we get over 30 because this is the only time we've been over 30 since that mm. point in time. I actually did post uh, an article 
and with a, a chart of silver. Um, and I think I started off by is silver bouncing exactly where it should at $29. I think I posted it about a week ago and I had posted another. The first one that I posted was on May 11th, talking about the breakout and that happened. Um, and we're in the process of now again, breaking to new highs. If you look at, uh, and I, I don't, I can't pull it up and, and show it to you on the screen. Uh, but if you look at the chart, at the bottom right hand corner of the chart is the is a hook on the MACD moving average convergence divergence and whether it, it's hooking downward or upward that generally gives you four to six maybe as much as eight weeks of going in that direction uh, silver pulled back to exactly where it should support was 29 the 50 day moving average was 29 we bounced off it and put two dollars on it uh, a little over two dollars in literally three trading days so silver has bounced exactly where it should bounce um it does it chop around here a little bit i i don't know uh it if it does it's certainly not going against you know any any uh chart patterns but this move is going to blow silver through 3250 uh the the target should be 34 to 37 and it with what's going on fundamentally, uh, 37 may be a very conservative number. But I do encourage you to go to my website, uh, BillHolter.com. Um, I would have posted that. Today is what, the the ninth. I would have posted Thanks. that uh, just before the 4th, like maybe June 30th, July 1st, something like that. Okay. What I'll, what I'll do is I'll go to your website afterwards. I'll put I'll uh, capture that article and put it on our Telegram so people can see that for posterity. So thanks for doing that. Um, so let's back up a second with that in mind, Bill. Uh, so if the Feds do cut, do let's say just say they do one rate cut like they say they're going to do. I I kind of wonder if they're not going to do more, but that's just my speculation. But let's say they do the one rate cut in September. Wouldn't that presuppose that that's going to help silver and gold and other things move up as well? Um, yeah, theoretically, it should help everything move higher. I suspect you will see gold and silver explode from that because just from the monetary standpoint, and it's just my hunch that the stock market does not act the way they want it to. Um, it's it's my guess is if, they, if we got a cut out of the blue, you might see a, a pretty severe sell-off in stocks. Um, and again, one of the reasons for the Fed to cut rates would be if there is a problem in markets. Uh, so that on its own may spook traders thinking, oh, no, the Fed just cut rates. There, there must be something wrong under the hood. And there is a lot of stuff mm -hmm. wrong under the hood. I mean, you could spend two hours talking about that. But I mean, obviously, the, the biggest thing wrong under the hood uh, is the unsustainable unsustainability of debt, uh, the losses throughout the banking system. And very few people are talking about derivatives now. And derivatives are way mm. bigger than they've ever been. They're way bigger than they were back in 2007, 2008. Um, the derivatives market is far larger than all the assets on the planet. So, I mean, that is the absolute definition of the tail wagging the dog. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought that up, Bill, about 2007 and 2008, because I was actually pivoting to my next question. You've been in the game a while, and you've seen historical patterns enough to, to see a trend. Um, do you think that, we'll say September for argument's sake, because obviously you remember uh, 2008, what happened with Lehman Brothers and you know all the unfortunate incidents of that job loss and suicides and the rest. Uh, do you see historical pattern happening again, but obviously on a much greater scale? Um, I don't know if you could call it a historical pattern because I mean, we're, we're in every day you wake up, we're in new, new territories for as far as the amount of debt, as far as mm -hmm. the amount of derivatives outstanding that they didn't do anything after 2008, 2009 to fix the problem. They didn't do anything uh, in 2019 when repo started 
blowing to 10% overnight. Uh, what they did was they brought forth COVID and COVID cooled off the demand for money and that allowed some breathing room. It also allowed them to create all kinds of money supply and create all kinds of new debt, which any Ponzi scheme always needs new capital coming in. So they did do that. Um, then we had the banking, the four banking failures last year in uh, what, March, April of 2023. And those four banks, by the way, if you look at the assets, if you look at them on an asset basis, those four banks uh, had more assets than all the banks put together in 2008, 2009 that went under. So 2023 was actually bigger than 2007, 8, 9, uh, but they were able to put it, you know, sweep it back under the rug. But that pile of shit under the rug is starting to grow and grow. Um, there was a story out, what, 62 banks are, uh, I, I guess, for lack of a better term, you could call them insolvent. They've got big problems on their balance sheet. And I mean, you're talking over, over a half a half a trillion dollars now of losses, unrealized losses in the banking system. And I mean, look at the Fed themselves. They're sitting on $165 billion of unrealized losses. That makes the Federal Reserve themselves insolvent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wipes out their equity. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 a massive maelstrom of crap, as you said, that's about to come to the surface. They they can't hide the elephant in the room any longer. It's untenable, and they don't have a war, so they don't have a cover store like they did in the past, as you are well aware. Um, it's been your contention, Bill, when we talked last time. I asked you about speaking on the banks for a second. I asked you if you thought you know Bank of America as an opining might be the first to go, and I think your response was it doesn't matter because once one goes down, they all go down. Do you still kind of maintain that position as time has gone on? Yeah, I mean, it's it's one giant financial orgy. You know, if you're in bed with any of them, you're in bed with all of them. One of them gets sick, they all get sick. If one of them dies, they all die. Yeah, yeah and definitely. Look, as long as you're talking about um, Bank America, it's my understanding sure. that they, they, they are sitting on uh, the big short position in silver. So it's going to be interesting to see you know, if silver blows to 35, 40 bucks, 50 bucks through 50 bucks, who's who's going to eat those losses? Because there's two sides to every trade in commodities. Mm -hmm. And margin got to be posted every single night. So it's going to be interesting to find out uh, who the big short is. And it, it, you know, seems like it's Bank America. And how big is that big short? And how much do they lose as the price goes higher? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, just on one last point on silver. Do you uh, believe, Bill, that the open pit silver mines in Mexico will be shut down now that Claudia Scheinbaum was elected? She recently stated that no additional concessions for open pit mining will be authorized and existing uh, concessions will undergo thorough evaluation with community consent and careful assessment of environmental repercussions. Um, it's a tough question to answer. I guess I would answer it by saying, do you think that she would preclude uh, Chinese firms from concessions, mining concessions? I mean, obviously, uh, her election brings uh, Mexico and, Ch and China closer together. And uh, I mean, China is going is reading right out of the U.S. playbook the, if you ever read the book uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, that's exactly what China is doing all over the world. And, uh, you know, China or uh, Mexico is extremely rich in silver. And what has China been doing all over the world? They've been running around trying to buy up gold and silver property. So uh, right. does it end up being some type of a backdoor, backdoor way that China gets to... Uh, gets to mine Mexican silver and basically control where that goes and the sale of it or or not sale of it and it just goes to mainland China. I don't know, but it, it looks to me like that's you know that's a very high potential scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. 
Um, well, I think we've pretty much exhausted a good amount for this time, Bill. Uh, is there anything left that you want to say to the audience? And again, obviously, where can people find your work? Well, I would just say time, every day you wake up, time is one day shorter to whenever this event's going to happen. It's my suspicion that the shit's going to hit the f before the election. Um, obviously, I could be wrong, but it just smells to me like desperation on the left, and I don't think they're going to walk willingly away from power. So it tells me they're going to come up with some type of false flag event, which will preclude an election and probably start some type of domino effect or sm snowball effect in markets. And uh, I would just be as ready as you can, um, you know, be as diligent as you can preparing because this, when it, when it hits, once, once the system is on its way down or has come down, you're locked in place. When I say you're locked in place, oh, well, I forgot to buy this or I forgot to buy that. Well, good luck. You're not buying it. Um, you might barter for it, but, you know, good luck finding whatever that specific item is or items that you need uh, because they're probably all going to be in demand. Um, so just do the best you can. And, and when I say do the best you can, if you've done the best you can and you forgot something or you made an error somewhere, don't beat yourself up. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's get it 100% right. But if you did the best you can, you did the best you can. Um, if you want to uh, follow my work, uh, it, my website is uh, billholter.com. There is a contact button. Um, if you're looking to, to uh, trade in precious metals, you can contact me through the website or you can go directly to my uh, business email, uh, bholter at proton.me. And as always, folks, as you know, we are an affiliate partner with Miles Franklin, of which Bill is one. So if you're looking, as he said, for precious metals or 401k IRA Roth conversions, Bill can certainly assist with that as well. Uh, Bill Holter, as always, an honor to have you. Thanks for joining the podcast, and we look forward to seeing you in the near future. Thank you, John. Thanks,